Hi, I'm Stephanie Craig. Welcome to the History Fangirl Podcast. This is episode six, The Lost City of Petra. Petra in modern day Jordan is a city that we see in pictures. It's splashed across Instagram accounts, travel websites, and Hollywood movies. But if you see its image, you're more likely to think of Indiana Jones rather than the Nabataean people who built it. My guest today is Jane Taylor, an author and photographer who has published multiple books on this fascinating city. We discuss the history of Petra, the rise and fall of the Nabataean people, and how a culture who left behind some of the most beautiful architecture the world has ever seen managed to be forgotten. At the end of this episode, find out how to enter this week's contest. Thank you so much. I'd like to introduce Jane Taylor, everyone. Jane is the author of several books about Petra, which we will talk about in a little bit. But um, Jane, first of all, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be with you. Why don't you start out by telling us, how did you first become interested in Petra? I was living in Jordan from the spring of 1989 onwards. And having done one book of aerial photographs of Jordan, I was looking around for a new subject and couldn't think of anything that would work both visually and in terms of its history until suddenly it dawned on me that Petra was the perfect subject, so visual, so beautiful, and with a fascinating background that I wanted to explore more. And so I started to write my first Petra book. I regard myself primarily as a writer. I did my degree in history, and that has always been my orientation, though I prefer to call it story because history sounds rather dry, and the story of the place is usually so fascinating. And uh, photography was uh, something that I did as an adjunct so that I could illustrate any articles that I was doing to begin with and then later on um, my books. So the two have worked in conjunction, in harmony together, which is, in a way, an ideal thing to be able to do. Oh, perfect. So why don't you start by sharing a little bit about the history of Petra? How was it founded? And maybe explain a little bit of the layout of the city. Petra is always associated nowadays with the Nabataeans, an Arab people who are the ones who are responsible for carving those extraordinary facades and building the temples there. But it was part of the territory of the Edomites, another Arab people who occupied the southern part of Jordan and ruled there in, well, mainly the Iron Age was the time of their dominance. So it was part of their territory. The Nabataeans, as traders, um, would have passed through this territory And at a certain time, nobody is completely certain when, but perhaps in the second century BC, as they were beginning to settle, their wealth demanded that they had places to to store their silver, their frankincense, their myrrh. They began to settle. And once you settle, you need a capital. And so at that point, as I say, probably in the second um, century BC, Petra began to be their capital. And from the first century BC to the end of the first century AD, they developed and refined and beautified it until it became, well, I was going to say what we see today, but of course what we see today is what centuries of neglect have done to it, but it's still an absolutely magnificent place to be, to to get to nowadays. So that is the early part, settling gradually in different places and wanting a capital that was as beautiful as any of their neighbors. I'm sure there was a lot of competition, especially, you know, first century BC, there was Herod the Great next door in Judea. Um, There were the Romans, there were the Greeks and the Nabataeans were traders. They traveled everywhere. They picked up ideas from the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, you name it. And they adapted these ideas into something that was uniquely their own. What do we know about their art style? Because the buildings are so unique. 
I mean, I've traveled a little bit around the greater region and it just doesn't really look like anything else, even though you could, you could be in Cyprus and see things in Greece and think, ah, this is very similar, even though it's not the same. But Petra just feels singular. Yes. Well, as I say, they adopted design ideas. You can see reflections of other cultures, of other architectural styles in their carved monuments and their buildings. But they're not exactly the same. They took an idea like the Assyrian crow step design, that sort of step design that is used on their facades. And they turned it into something that the Assyrians would have recognized, but said, well, that's a different way of using it. And the same with um, with classical um, styles, the um, the Greek and Roman columns and engaged columns, um, capitals, what they did with these was use them in a, in a way that weren't exactly as they had been used by their original creators, if you like. What do we know about the Nabataean people? Do we know any of their historical figures or any of their stories? I mean, one of the big problems with anyone who's looking into the story of the Nabataeans, there has never been found, and I long for the day when it might be found, we don't know of any self-written history of the Nabataeans. There are no annals of the Nabataean kings, no royal biographers. So nothing like that has been found. All we have are inscriptions on tombs and on coins, things that have been written about them by Greek and Roman writers and a Jewish writer who don't necessarily regard them in a particularly friendly way. They're usually with a a certain amount of sometimes reluctant admiration but there's nothing directly from the Nabataeans themselves so it has to be a question of weaving together ideas of from other writers, from other groups of people, and marrying it with what has been found by archaeologists in their excavations. What do some of their contemporaries, what do the Romans say about them? To go to the Greek writer Strabo, A friend of his actually was living in the Nabataean capital for a while, and he was very admiring of the way the Nabataeans were ruled. And he said that they're a sensible people, and they're extremely well governed. And he also mentioned, which must have been a bit of a surprise for a Greek, that they, they had hardly any slaves. So there's something extraordinary about the way they organized their society on probably much more equal basis than their contemporaries. The way they treated women seems to be different in that we know that there were Nabataean queens who, when widowed, became regents for their son. So they had an important, what we nowadays would like to think of as a normal role in Nabataean society in a way that the others didn't. They were very good at making money, which made the Romans in particular extremely jealous and wanting Mm -hmm. to have it for themselves. Thank you. What do we know about their language? There's some uncertainty about what language they actually spoke. There's a theory that they spoke a form of Arabic but wrote a form of Aramaic. And the Nabataean script that we see in inscriptions in Petra, in Medayan Saleh, another Nabataean site in the northern part of Saudi Arabia, that's all in the Aramaic script, which developed in different ways in different areas. And the Nabataean form of the Aramaic script is really the most beautiful and the most fluent of those that we know of from this early time. But possibly they were actually communicating with each other face to face in a form of of Arabic. What we do know is that Arabic was first written down in the Nabataean script. 
and from that developed the Arabic script that is, is used today over a few centuries. Aramaic was the lingua franca of the, of the whole region, from the Mediterranean to Afghanistan, from Turkey down to Egypt. So it was clearly a language to be mastered and used in all your trading practices, for example. That's incredibly interesting. As someone who speaks no languages, I actually really love the history of language because I feel like it's one of the few things I can understand about foreign languages. So Petra was the capital. What do we know about their greater kingdom? It extended um, at its height from Damascus. They actually captured Damascus from the Seleucids uh, who had governed Syria and northern Jordan after the death of Alexander the Great. But they lost it again. But for a number of years, decades even, their kingdom extended from Damascus in the north down to Medayan Saleh in the south, which is in the Hejaz in, um, in Saudi Arabia. And from the other side of the Jordan River, the Negev Desert, sort of well out into the eastern desert of Jordan. So it was quite a large area at its height. And it was the only part, once the Romans started getting really acquisitive in the Middle East, it was the only area that maintained some form of independence for the longest. Then in 106 AD, the Romans finally took over, sent in governors, the royal family came to an end. and but not life. Life went on in the capital in Petra and in other areas of the Nabataean kingdom. Does anyone know why they were able to hold out longer than the other people in the area against the Romans? Again, there are a lot of theories, but since we um, have nothing from the Nabataeans themselves and only a very brief reference in one or two Roman authors, about how the Romans took over the Nabataean kingdom. There is no reference to a war, though there may have been one. There is nothing written about it. It might possibly, it's been theorized by some scholars, that maybe the last king did a deal with the Romans to treat people well, allow the king to remain as long as he lived, and then the Romans could have it afterwards. We don't know, but that's one theory. It could be that he had no viable sons to to carry on. I say viable, we know he had some sons. Whether they had survived or whether they were fit to rule, we don't know. So it's all shrouded in mystery, but Clearly, it was the only missing piece in the Roman jigsaw of the Middle East, and they wanted it by hook or by crook. <laughs> so you said 106 AD was when they were taken over? Yeah. Who was the last king? He was called Rabel II, and he ruled both from Petra and from Bostra, today's Bostra in, in southern Syria. Um, that was the alternate capital in the in the last the reigns of the last two Nabataean kings. Are there any other Nabataean sites that are maybe not as famous as Petra, but are significant and someone would potentially want to visit? The site that I've, I've already mentioned, Madayan Saleh, was known to the Nabataeans as Hegra. And that has a wealth of these beautiful tombs carved into the sandstone mountains of that region in northern Saudi Arabia. The Saudis would love to develop it more for tourism. I think it's more that a lot of people aren't so keen to um, to go there, but it is an amazing sight and well worth seeing. Well, if anyone from the Saudi Tourism Board is ever listening to this and wants to have me come and uh, talk about it in the future, I would love to. So just FYI, I'm available if they need some help with this. Well, uh, good. Sounds amazing. Good. <laughs> <laughs> have you have you been there? I've been there twice, yes. And there are ongoing excavations by a joint French and Saudi team. So every year they have a season um, excavating 
among what remains of the the settlement at Medayan Sali, which was mainly buried under under drift sand, and also uncovering some of their sort of sacred places. It is feasible to get there. Wow, well, I will be looking into that for the future. So thank you for that information. (laughs) You do realize that normally you need to have either a father, a brother, a husband, or a son accompanying you if you are a single woman. I can figure out, my 25-year-old brother is not, um, he does some day trips for with me in Oklahoma City when I'm there. So maybe I can convince him that Saudi Arabia is our next stop. (laughs) Absolutely well worth persuading him. (laughs) How did you end up going? I wanted to go there to photograph for a book I did. Having done a book about Petra, I then decided to do a book about the Nabataeans. So I had to get to that other glorious Nabataean site. And some diplomat friends in Amman organized a trip in which I could join. And then a few years later, I went again with a trip organized by the Friends of Archaeology in Amman. Some of these inconvenient things about single women were sort of overlooked. Oh, interesting. Okay, so we've gotten through Petra and the Romans come in and taking over. What do we know about the history of the city under the Romans or in the you know millennia that followed? The Romans appointed governors who were based in or around Petra. And of course, there were sections of the Roman army that were settled all around the the erstwhile Nabataean kingdom. Um, apart from that, you know, most of the regular administration jobs were carried out by the same people who had done them before, and people's lives went on much the same as ever, but their taxes went to the emperor in Rome instead of to the Nabataean king. Um, I think it was it was more the trading considerations that led to Petra's gradual decline, doubtless helped along by the occasional earthquake, particularly a, a very big one that happened in the mid fourth century. A lot of rebuilding was done, but a lot wasn't. And it was a, the diversion of trade routes, trade being done in in different ways. Um, not by overland route, but by by sea. But it was still quite a flourishing place. And there are some records from the 6th century, which were discovered in Petra, in a church in Petra in 1993, some papyrus scrolls that date from those that are dated, are from the very beginning of the 6th century until the end. It tells of a society that is doing nicely, mainly agriculturally based, certainly not a completely diminished society. But I think that changed within the next century or so. And people who had options went and lived somewhere else where they could continue with their trading or whatever they wanted to do. And the people who remained tended to be the people without options. And it seems that some of them live a very poor life, which must have been difficult. I want to pause for a moment to talk about our sponsor, Audible. For you, the listener of the History Fangirl podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. For today's episode, I decided to recommend The History of the Ancient World from the Earliest Accounts to the Fall of Rome, which is by Susan Wise Bauer. I downloaded this book probably two or three years ago. I've listened to it annually since I got it. It's it's a really good value for audio entertainment. It's 26 hours. And she does a really good job of explaining what was going on in China and what was going on in Italy and what was going on in Mesopotamia in parallel so that you not only understand, you know, this is who the Persians were and what was happening with the Persians, but also this is what was going on in Asia 
when this other thing was going on in Europe, you can understand how the timelines are connected, which is something I really appreciate. Sometimes in my head, the stories get told in isolation. And so this is a really fascinating book, but she also does a really good job of, of discussing things in tangent enough that you can understand a bigger picture than just the culture you're examining at that moment. To download your free copy, go to audibletrial.com slash history fangirl. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash history fangirl for your free audiobook. I recommend books because I love them and I think you guys should check them out. But you can pick any audiobook for your free one. You don't have to take my recommendation. So if there's something else you like, go ahead and get it. But this would be my recommendation to go with this episode. I've heard of Petra as the lost city. How did it come to disappear? And I'm sure that people locally were aware of it, but I guess on the world stage it disappeared. And how did it come to be rediscovered? As you say, the the, the people locally continued to know about it. And it seems that there was agriculture going on in the region the whole time. It was clearly regarded as an important center more the area rather than Petra itself, in the early Crusader period, because, I mean, in the same year that the Crusaders captured Jerusalem, they sent an expedition over to the Petra area. Um, There were still monks in the monastery, the big monastery on the, the local mountain, who had asked for help. And the Crusaders established one of their very early bases in Petra. So, you know, it wasn't totally insignificant. It just wasn't a regional capital or any kind of, you know, real centre of action. But it had its importance. After the Crusades, that there's really a gap in our knowledge. And uh, there are virtually no references to Petra from the 13th century, maybe 14th century, until the Swiss Johann Ludwig Burkhardt, working for a British exploration society, decided to go and visit it as he was traveling south through Jordan. Um, So it was known about from classical writers, from references in crusader literature, but to the West, it was unknown until Burkhardt rediscovered it for the West in um, 1812. So I'm thinking, you know, when you think about rediscoveries like Pompeii, there was a frenzy. What was the international reaction to his rediscovery of Petra? It aroused enormous interest. He had written a number of books on his travels. Um, He was a considerable scholar. His language skills were extraordinary. And he passed himself off as a Muslim from India. So although he spoke excellent Arabic, he had this funny accent. Mm -hmm. That was his entree into places that he might not otherwise have been welcomed in. The society for whom he was working published his book, in fact, some years after, in 1822, five years after he had died in Cairo of dysentery. But news of his discovery had leaked out. You know, WikiLeaks is nothing new. (laughs) This this story leaked out and other people had already visited Petra before his book actually came out. The next people to visit it was a group of, that we know about, was a group of Brits who went there in um, 1817 or 18 also wrote about their visit. And then there was a Frenchman a few years later. And so it went on. What started as a trickle became an absolute deluge. The place had, the the region had been opened up by Napoleon's interest. First of all, his, um, his conquest of Egypt and then his attempt to conquer Palestine, Egypt in 1799, Palestine the next year. And he'd taken a group of scholars with him who wrote, drew, mapped, and did everything they could to record what they were seeing, the extraordinary monuments of every period that they were seeing in Egypt and in Palestine. And this, too, aroused an enormous interest. 
and encourage people to go and see these things for themselves. So people would turn up with their copy of Strabo or Pliny um, from the Roman authors, or the Bible, of course, was a, was a big um, thing to have. One guidebook said, the Bible is the best guidebook. It took a bit of piecing together mm-hmm. to, to know which places were actually called what name in the biblical period, but um, people were in, very enthusiastic about doing that. And so more and more people started coming, thanks to Napoleon. So with Pompeii and with some other discoveries, there was a rush of objects leaving the country. Were, were there a lot of objects left to be discovered and what happened to them? Jordan, in fact, was rather less frequented. You, you had to be a little bit more daring to go to the area that is now Jordan. Most people went to Egypt and to Palestine. But a few brave souls like Burkhardt and, and others went east of the Jordan Rift Valley and, and visited Petra. And so it gradually became more visited. But it, was, it wasn't easy. The Bedouin weren't enthusiastic about foreigners coming and um, wandering through their space. It had been bad enough for them with the um, the Hajj pilgrimage caravans going through every year for the last few hundred years. So this new invasion of um, non-Muslims was not widely welcomed. With the rediscovery, when did it start becoming a mission of Jordan to preserve it and turn it into um, a travel site? Well, of course, Jordan didn't exist until after... World War One. Up until then, it had been a part of the Ottoman Empire. And it was the sort of redrawing of the map of the Middle East that created local government's concern about how to manage benefit from, and at times, they actually thought of preserving the heritage that these new lines on maps had um, had given to them. So you get a whole new attitude after um, World War I and new governments being established under either French or British mandate, French, Syria and Lebanon and British, Palestine, Jordan and Iraq. So you had these foreign powers, first of all, concerned to help develop these antiquities that were then very quickly taken over by local, in Jordan's case, a department of antiquities was set up and the concept of preserving sites for posterity became common so that there was protection that was set up for taking antiquities out. It didn't stop antiquities being taken out of the country Um, Where there is a market, unfortunately, you will always have people, often the people who do the stealing of antiquities, digging up of graveyards, are the ones that have real problems feeding their families. But the people who provide the market are really the ones that we need to be after. So let's talk a little bit about what it's like to travel to Petra today. I think most people will have heard of the treasury, and that's what people think of when they think of a big carved building, what Indiana Jones stood in front of in the movie, or I guess he was on a horse. But that's kind of what what comes to people's mind is the treasury. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that building? The treasury is simply the, the foretaste of Petra itself, and the fact that you have to go down this long, narrow canyon to get to it only adds to the drama of when you see it at the end of that narrow gorge. And it is a mind-blowing moment when you when you first clap eyes on that extraordinary glowing monument. But as you know, um, this is such a small part of Petra. And I, I find when I take groups to Petra is that their overall feeling is one of amazement that the site is so big. (laughs) (laughs) The scale of it 
um, people cannot really get to grips with before you actually see it yourself. And if you haven't got fit before you go into Petra, you're going to have a very uncomfortable day after. I completely agree. Uh, just uh, my experience was so I did. I went to Petra at night because I happened to get in. I got in Thursday afternoon, and I had Thursday and Friday to Thursday afternoon and Friday to to enjoy Petra, and then I had Saturday to go to Wadi Rum, and then Sunday I had to go back to Oman. So I went to Petra at night just because I wanted to have a few extra hours, and so you walk all the way down there and back. And then the next day I walked all the way and I, and I think I got down to about where you start to climb at the very, so like past the, the colonnade and, and I just got to where I was like, I don't want to walk anymore. <laughs> I would like to sit for a little while. And then you got to turn around and get back. And oh yeah. Up. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so people who haven't been there are aware there's lots of locals with animals to ride and there's some signs that really you know, express like that's not probably a great idea to actually get one of these rides. And I was just kind of, you know more about the ecosystem than I do. How do you feel about the horse and the camels and, and everything that it's there for to cart people along? Because there's no vehicles allowed once you're in the city. You can, under special circumstances, have a horse and carriage that takes you right through the center of, of Petra. But this is mainly for people who are less able to walk than most people have some kind of um, disability. For most of us, we've got to walk. You can, actually, it's fun to ride a camel in Petra. And the Bedouin owners, I mean, particularly nowadays when tourism is not so great, or last year when it was minimal, this is their living. They are giving rides to people to make a living and they're mostly extremely nice and will help you and look after you and not rip you off. You need to negotiate a price that you're prepared to pay beforehand and then stick with it. Equally with with donkeys, a lot of people find the climb up to the monastery just that step too far <laughs> that's, I, I didn't make it to the monastery I was I, that's where I decided nope I'm done my legs are done well next time half four legs because <laughs> the, the donkeys are very sure footed and uh, they get you up to the monastery with the minimum of effort I would suggest that you don't take the donkey going down because the whole feeling of um, everything disappearing in front of you as you go down steep steps is not a particularly comfortable one. So ride up and walk down is my advice. Oh, good. Well, at least we know, because I I hadn't done my research very well before I got there, and I didn't really, you know, there are some parts of the world where you really don't want to be participating in animal rides and some parts where it's perfectly fine, and so I'm glad to get an expert opinion on what the situation is at Petra so that other people can can make that decision and not feel like their legs are going to fall off like I felt. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, the, the trick is you need to negotiate the price beforehand and then stick with it. Riding a horse into Petra, which is only to the beginning of the seat, personally, there is so much that is of such fascination that I would advise against doing it and the horse owners, unfortunately, don't have a particularly good reputation. So walk in, but hire either a camel or a donkey when you're inside Petra. Excellent. So we talked a little bit about the treasury. What is your favorite place to go when you're in Petra? I think it has to be the monastery. It is such an extraordinary building from it, the point of view of its size and the fact that you have to work hard to get there probably adds to the, the sense of achievement when you turn around and there is this enormous facade carved into the rock towering over you. It's much simpler than the treasury. It doesn't have the, the ornamental flourishes that the treasury has. To me, this seems very much in keeping with the with the whole ethos of the Nabataean people. They had simple, straightforward ideas, and that is 
to me, reflected in the design and decoration of the monastery. But it is also close to one of the most stupendous views you will ever see out over the mountains and down to Wadi Araba. So it's well worth making the effort. So next time you go... I do have a feeling that sometimes you end up going back to some place you think, I'll never be back here. And then there's a conference or your friend moves there and you end up somewhere a second time. And I just kind of feel in my heart that Jordan is that place is going to be one of those places for me. So I feel like I'm going to be in a situation where I'll be back, but we'll see what happens. (laughs) Yes. Well, beware. It gets hold of you. I went to live there for a year and stayed for 27. So what to do. (laughs) Um, One thing I do want to talk about just for anybody who's planning on going or is listening to this um, before a trip, I found Petra to be a little bit of a culture shock in terms of how aggressive just the street vendors and how much haggling really is expected. And I traveled in Israel, but I hadn't traveled really much around the rest of the Middle East. So I can't tell you, you know, how similar it is. But do you have any tips for dealing with that for um, the kind of onslaught of negotiation that is expected of you once you get there? I think you need to learn the Arabic for no, and I don't want it. (laughs) But it must be in Arabic. Help us out. What is Arabic for I don't want it? Uh, Mabidi. 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 Okay. Mabidi. I will remember that for next time as well. Thank you so much. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Jane, I really appreciate you taking the time to share with us your knowledge of Petra. I find it fascinating, even having been... Once, I just feel like I only even, you know, touched a tiny little bit of what is out there. So I do hope I make my way back someday. You have two books. Why don't you tell us about the one that's available on Amazon? And then we'll mention the one that's available if someone's in Jordan. My very first book on Jordan was called High Above Jordan. And it was a book of aerial photographs because I'd had the extraordinary privilege of being able to do some aerial photography in various places. And 20 years later, with having done a lot more aerial photography, I decided that I would do a completely new book of aerial photographs, incorporating some of the best of um, the earlier ones, but using some that had never been used before. And I had the opportunity to do some more aerial photography. So the book is called Jordan Images from the Air, and that is available on Amazon. And it has aerial photographs of all the major and some of the minor sites throughout Jordan, with some of the background story to each of those places. Of course, it has a fairly large section on Petra, because it is the major site in the whole of Jordan. So that then came out in Jordan, and it's available in Jordan in English, French, German, Italian, and Spanish. But on Amazon, it's just available in English hardback. Well, hopefully our listeners speak pretty good English, I would imagine. (laughs) I think we'll find that pretty helpful. And then if they're in Jordan, your other book is available in Jordan, correct? Having done a book on Petra, I was shocked at how there was nothing for the ordinary reader to find out something about the Nabataeans who created Petra. And so I decided to do a book about the Nabataeans. And that is called Petra and the Lost Kingdom of the Nabataeans. And it's out of stock at the moment in Britain. Hopefully we'll reprint one day before too long. But for the time being, it's available quite widely at all the tourist outlets in Jordan. Oh, is this the book that's literally on every bookshelf that you walk through? Um, Well, I hope so. (laughs) I'm thinking it is. I'm thinking I got in a uh, fight with someone over one dinar and walked away, and I am now seriously regretting it. So so what we'll do is, in the show notes, there's going to be a link to the blog post that covers this episode and has all of the the transcript from this interview and there'll also be links to well link to the amazon book and also to jane to your website so um if you're interested there's going to be links you can go and find those immediately after you listen to the show great well thank you very much indeed jane thank you so much for joining us this afternoon and for sharing all your your lovely 
books and for your depth of knowledge. And I feel like I've learned so much. And I hope, uh, listeners, I hope you feel like you've learned something as well. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for letting me talk about my favorite place on earth. (laughs) Thank you. And if I do go back, I'm going to check back in with you and see what else I missed. (laughs) Do that. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you and have a lovely afternoon. I want to say thank you again to Jane Taylor. For those who have subscribed to the show already, thank you. If you want more episodes, please subscribe in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you would take a moment to rate and review the show, it helps tremendously with helping others find the podcast. I want to share a review that um, a listener, his username or her username is hello, and then about 10 or so exclamation points, which is a fantastic username. They're in Canada, and they recently left this review. History Fangirl knows her stuff, and she delivers it in a fun, engaging way for listeners of all ages. I especially love that she travels so much. She's literally on the ground, letting us relive through her eyes historical events around the world. Thank you so much for your review and your kind words, and for really disseminating the essence of the show so perfectly. Um, I, as a travel blogger, I don't leave a place as a historical expert on it as much as I'd leave a huge fan of it. And so getting an expert on the phone or on Skype and going over it, I learn a lot and I hope you guys learn a lot too. If there are places you guys want me to cover, you can definitely leave a comment on my blog and say you'd like me to cover X. If I've already been there, cool, I'll find someone and we'll talk about it. And if I haven't been there, I might try to put that place on my travel itinerary for the next, you know, six months so that I can do a show on it. Part of the show, too, is getting me to go to different places that maybe I wouldn't go to on my own. The prize for this week's giveaway. So every week I'm giving away something. This week, the prize is a $20 Amazon gift card. If you want to enter, all you have to do is go to historyfangirl.com. Find the blog post for this episode, which will be up on the banner all week and leave a comment to be a newsletter subscriber. So leave a comment. It can be feedback on the episode, a place you'd like me to cover in the future, your travel tips for any of the places we've covered. It just has to be on the blog post for this week. And then you have to be a newsletter subscriber. So you're going to check the box to be a newsletter subscriber when you leave the comment. Just make sure to confirm it in your email so that I have lots of future giveaways lined up already with some cool companies. So I'll do Amazon gift cards a lot, but there's also some travel companies that are going to do giveaways for you guys of some cool travel gear. There's a company um, that I'm really excited to share with you guys soon that's going to be giving away a really cool prize. So once you're a newsletter subscriber and you leave a comment the first time, you can enter every week. So yeah, good luck.